Um, maybe you're like, hey, what is going on? Uh, the band is not up here, and Tanner doesn't have an instrument in his hand. This is wrong. This is not okay. Well, today is a little bit different, if you haven't noticed. Um, Pastor Lauren is at home, uh, and his, he and his wife have both tested positive for COVID. They're doing okay. But um, because of it, he had to actually miss Christmas Eve services. He's missing today. And uh, he goes, hey, man, will you figure something out? <laughs> and I said, yeah, dude, I got you. I can do this. So uh, you guys walked in today maybe expecting a normal service, and you got me. Good luck. Good luck. You guys can just hold on. It will be all right. So here's, here's kind of what we're going to do today. This is, I'll give you the layout of what today is going to look like. You guys are now, when you showed up, if you're streaming online, you tuned in, you're checking us out, you're all, for today, honorary members and students of our worship school. You're going to get kind of like this peek behind the curtain, so to speak, of what, what happens in our worship school, what happens when we worship at home together, what does that kind of look like? That's kind of what is going to happen today. And I just got to be honest with you. I'm incredibly nervous. This is not my comfort zone. And that's okay because I know you guys have my back. And so we're going to do this together. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. If you're here in the room, indulge me a little bit. Would you stand up with me? This is like what we would normally do. We stand up. We're getting ready to proclaim some things or sing some things. If you're at home, I want you to tune in. I don't want you to kick back on the couch. I want you to join in with us. We're going we're gonna to see how good we are at addition today. We're going to do some addition problems um, and see if we can figure this out together as a church family. Here's how this is going to work. I'm going to put some, we're going to put some, uh, some numbers on the screen for you. And we are going to add up each number. And as we move through and we read each number, we're going to holler out, we're going to yell out together the sum of the numbers put together. Okay? I know that's confusing. Here's what, how we're going to do it. You see the numbers here? It's listed out. Here's what we're going to do. This is it's a practice run. Everyone say this with me. 1,000, 1,040, 2,040, 2,070, 3,070, 3,090, 4,090, 5,000. Okay, let's pull the numbers off the screen. You guys kind of got what it is, right? You kind of figured out this is how we're going to do this. You at home... I want you to jump in with us as well. Okay, we're going to do this together, but like we mean it, okay? Here's how we're going to do this. And if you don't know and you can't think fast enough like me, just copy whatever I say. It's fine. I'll help you out. I have it on. I, I'm not looking up here. I'm looking right here. Okay. Here we go. Put those numbers back on the screen for us. Here we go. 1,000, 1,040, 2,040, 2,070, 3,070, 3,090, 4,090, 5,000. Okay. You can do better than that, I think. I, I hear you guys sing every weekend. Let's do this together. Here we go. 1,000, 1,040, 2,040, 2,070, 3,070, 3,090, 4,090, 5,000. Okay, guys, sit down. It's okay. Um, it's okay. Here's the thing. You got, it's not 5,000. 4,090 plus 10 is not 5,000. It never will be. What is it? 4,100. 4,090 plus 10 is 4,100. It's not 5,000. You guys are terrible. Oh. What am I, what, what's, what, what's this for? As a worship pastor, I am concerned. Not because we can't add. I think as a community, we should be concerned that in our culture, especially when it comes to worship, we might just be a bunch of Christians shouting 5,000, and we're not even close. We're not even close. Here's kind of our big thought for the day. When worship goes wrong in Scripture, everything goes wrong. When worship goes wrong in Scripture, everything goes wrong. There are plenty of places in the Bible that we see this. Uh, the first place we see it is in Genesis. Another place we see it is in Isaiah, where God says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, 
I hide my eyes from you. Oof. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Are you kidding me? This is tough. God literally says, I don't see your worship. I'm not going to see it. This is really hard. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 says, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably. Can we get worship wrong? What does that mean? What is this telling us? I think it's telling us this. God isn't looking for just any type of worship. He's looking for a specific type of worship. He's looking for acceptable worship. What does our worship look like? Let me, ask, let me ask a few questions. If I were to ask the question, what is worship? Chances are I would get all kinds of answers. And some of them would probably be good. What is worship? Okay, so because if I asked that question, I would get so many different kinds of answers. Let me ask a few other questions. What kind of worship do we usually see in our context? What kind of worship are we experiencing week in and week out? What kind of worship are we as Christians, as Christ followers, offering up? What kind of worship are we offering up? I think these are the questions that we really need to ask ourselves. And I think we need to be honest. Even if it means that the answers that we get to those questions aren't exactly what we had hoped it would be. What kind of worship do we usually see in our context? What kind of worship are we experiencing week to week? And what kind of worship are we as Christ followers offering up? I think there's a shift that we need to make in our culture, not, not just in our community, not just here at Colonial Church, but as a body of believers, the church at large. I think too many people confuse passion with love. I think too often we want to be passionate about God. And that's okay. Um, being passionate about God isn't a bad thing, but passion and love aren't the same things. They're different. I think, to be honest, we're in a time where the Western church really only knows how to see God in the fireworks. In these moments that we create each weekend, the moments we work so hard to produce, when the band is incredible, the lights are perfect, um, Everything is so produced that it's almost without flaw. That's where we see God. And we think that is worship. That's where God's revealing himself to us. And I love those things. Don't get me wrong. We have a band each week. And our band, y'all, I got to tell you, our band is awesome. We have an incredible team here at Colonial. We're grateful to have them. I love these things. The problem with this is it only counts for a small portion of where God is revealing himself. We spend an hour each week receiving the word of God and proclaiming his name through music. And that one hour a week only counts for 0.5% of our weekly time. 0.5%. Something is wrong. When we can only see God in the big emotive moments the fireworks. We miss out on the other 99.5% of what God is doing because we don't know how to look for him burning in a candle. What do I mean by this? I think about the first time I met my wife, Shelby. Um, we had a lot of passion kind of build up for each other. She was cute, she was funny, and man, we liked each other. And the thing is that when you first start dating someone, all you really show the other person is the best version of yourself. You know what I mean? You, uh, you make sure you look a certain way. You speak a little gentler than you would normally. Um, you do all the sorts of things that kind of showcase who you are at your best. Right? I think about what would my marriage look like 
if we had never moved beyond being passionate for one another and being in the passion and developed our relationship further. Like if we had just left it there. She was cute. She was funny. Perfect. I think she was attractive probably. Maybe. I think she was perfect. And I know without a doubt, no question in my mind, she would think that I was attractive and I was perfect. I would make, I would make sure of that. We'd really only be able to have a pretty shallow understanding of each other. And because of that, pretty shallow relationship. But what happens? The more we learn about each other, the more we saw the real sort of raw version of one another. The more we experienced and went through difficult seasons together, ultimately, the more that that passion that we originally had for each other grew and developed into this kind of tested, tried and true love. We learn more about each other, and we begin to love each other in spite of our flaws. In the beginning of our relationship, her assumed perfection pretty much demanded the same of me, and vice versa. If we had, had never grown our relationship beyond that, one, it would have been incredibly exhausting. Two, the more facade I would have had to create in order to maintain that interaction. How many times do you see this scenario played out in our worship experiences? What can we do to keep their attention? What new song can we do that they're going to love? What does the stage need to look like now? How can we keep the attraction? How many times have you experienced this? Have you ever said to yourself, I'm just struggling to feel or sense God? Or maybe you've said, I don't know how to feel God's presence. I think we're looking at worship the wrong way. It wasn't until, I, until Shelby and I got real with one another and saw each other as flawed and broken and not perfect that we began to truly know what the other person was like. And because of that, we actually got to experience and give real, true love to one another. Not just be attracted to the best parts, the best show. We need to learn to love God, not just feel intensely for him. We need to learn to love him. In our Western culture, this is really hard to do. Uh, as a worship pastor, I can tell you I have gone uh, both sides of this spectrum where I have thought we need to just do the most uh, significant thing, the newest thing, because what if they lose interest? And in my own insecurity, sometimes I can choose to do some things because I want our church to like what we do. That's exhausting. <laughs> it really is. How have you had to do that in your life? It's hard to do, to not just feel intensely for him, but to learn to love him. We want to be wowed. We want to be blown away by the presence of God. And because of this, we tend to blend passion and love together. We make them synonymous. We want sensation. We want the show. We want the spectacle. We want the fireworks. Being, don't hear me the wrong way. Being passionate in worship isn't bad. It's just incomplete. It's the beginning. Being passionate in worship is the beginning. Here's the deal. Worship isn't always glamorous, but it is always glorious. Worship isn't always glamorous, but it is always glorious. Our worship has to look like our real life, day in and day out. The be beautiful, full of mess worship. It, just, it can't just be about the YouTube highlight reels. I love this quote from priest John Stott. He says, all true worship is a response to the self-revelation of God in Christ and Scripture and arises from our reflection on who he is and what he has done. The worship of God is evoked 
informed and inspired by the vision of God. True knowledge of God will always lead us to worship. What does scripture have to say about this? If, if you can get worship wrong, if we, if we can worship in a way that causes God to shield his eyes from us, what's the right way to worship? John 4 has the answer. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. For God is spirit, and so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Both of those need to be present to have acceptable worship. Dallas Willard says this, Since God is spirit, nothing is hidden from him. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and therefore in truth. Nothing is hidden. Sometimes I think as a church, we can kind of create... um, we can kind of create a mess for ourselves because we act like the wizard in Wizard of Oz. Do you remember this? Um, as a church, we want to appear this all-powerful, immune to the hardships of life, perfect version of ourselves. We say or we act out the famous line in the Wizard of Oz where Toto the dog pulls back the curtain, revealing the man, and the Oz says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Do you remember this? We want to appear all-powerful, immune to these problems. But the reality for us is we can only give acceptable worship when we can begin to worship as we are. It's not about the highlight reels. Those are awesome. But worship, it's about your real, full-of-hardship life. Isn't it exhausting to put on that facade? We were created to worship in spirit and in truth. We can only worship as we are. If we can worship from the place of where we truly are, it will be acceptable. Why? Because there is truth found there. And if we can let the word of God anchor us, root us in scripture, then our worship will be fueled by the truth found in the Bible. Okay, so as we said, in John 4 it says, worship in spirit and truth. What is spirit? What is truth? Well, here it is. Spirit is spiritual, spontaneous, beautiful, emotional, poetic, passionate. These are all really, really good things. They're not wrong. These are really, really good things. That must be there. What is truth? Truth would be scriptural, substantial, theological, literal, considerate. So if worship is spirit and truth, how do we live into this? Well, first, we've got to recognize that we don't have a relationship with a book. We have a relationship with a person. The book points us to Jesus, period. The book points us to this person. Second, we've got to remember that we don't always see things as they are. We see things as we are. We have a really hard time getting beyond our own personal lens. And that is just a fact. Growing up, I heard there's there's three sides to every story. Have you heard this? There's their side, my side, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So we've got to recognize this. So to put simply, we can't perform our way through this. We have got to experience revelation transformation in our own life and begin to share that in our worship and in our community. What is worship? I asked this question earlier. What is worship? And I said, I get a bunch of different answers. So to help us with that and to eliminate the bunch of different answers, I'm going to give you a definition for what is worship. Worship is the natural expression of what is at the center of our lives. That's what worship is. Can you worship other things besides God? Absolutely. Whatever is at the center of your life, whatever fuels you, whatever fuels the decisions that you make, in effect, that is what you worship. For some, it's money. 
For some, it may be uh, vacation. How many? I, I, I know I long for the vacation. <laughs> Worship is a natural expression of what's at the center of our lives. That's not specific to God, but it is also true about how we worship God. Here's kind of what I want to, we're going to, we are going to sing today because they gave me a mic to talk and again, uh, I'm much better with a band and a team and let's worship together. So I'm going to invite our team up, but I want to leave you with this. If we can let the word of God expose us to the heart of God, we can begin to recognize the voice of God and experience the move of God. So if we can let the word of God expose us to the heart of God, then we can begin to recognize the voice of God and experience the move of God. We've got to worship as we are. We, we, we can be nothing other than truthful to ourselves. We can't perform our way through this. Your worship has got to be fueled by where you are. We've got to be honest about where we are in our walk. And we've got to let the word of God inform us that we can be transformed, that we can be changed, and we can be moved closer and closer in relationship with him. I know when my wife calls my phone, I don't have to have my phone tell me it's her. As soon as I pick up the phone and I hear her voice, I know it's her. Why? I've spent time with her. Scripture gives us the opportunity to learn the person of Jesus, to learn the character of God. The more time we spend with that, the more we will get to know and we can recognize his voice in our life because we're familiar with it. It's really difficult for the devil to confuse the voice of God if we get to know God. We've got to worship in truth. And we have to worship in spirit. So today, you're going to see both of those things. We've talked about some scripture. We've talked about some truth. I got the chance as a worship pastor to stay. This is what I believe worship is. This is how I lead our team. This is how we try to facilitate worship within our church. Do we get it right all the time? Absolutely not. But this is what we, this is what we long for. We want to help our church and our community learn to love God. We're going to sing a song. We're going to introduce a song um, that Shelby and I wrote. And uh, it's called Breakthrough. And uh, this song is maybe, as I think about, there's a bunch of songs we could have done to follow this kind of a conversation. But I think this song, because I know my wife so well, this song represents her being very real in the moment of what God was saying to her, the things she was experiencing and worshiping through that. This song kind of came at a time when her identity was um, maybe in question. Uh, most people don't know this. Many, many people don't know this, but my wife's an autism specialist, so she worked, in, um, she worked here in Wichita Falls ISD in the LEAP unit, which is a language-enriched autistic program. Um, we have a heart for special needs. Um, you ask most people who know the Hodges family, we're about two things. We're about worship, and we're about special needs. We're about the autism community. And um, she poured a lot of her heart and soul into that, teaching in a classroom over in Burt Burnett ISD when she transitioned over there. And we had a, we had a, um, a moment, she had a moment where she felt like God was just saying, I think your season of doing that right now is up. And that really disrupted, <laughs> that really disrupted her identity. And so um, she began, I, maybe better than I ever could have. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm grateful to be married to her. She, she steps into these hard times and she worships through it. I'm up here working, I'm doing all the things up here, and she is at home, not getting up every morning, going to a classroom like she's used to doing. And she's just worshiping, and she's asking God, God, where are you in this? What am I supposed to be doing? Wrestling with, who am I? Who are you in light of who I am? If all these things that I thought I was moving toward is coming to a close, who am I? And that's kind of where this song came from. So we want to we invite you to stand. We're going to... We're going we're gonna to sing together. We're going to, um, like again, we're going to show you kind of this is what happens. This is how you can worship in your own home. I think one of the things God's telling me about this year is how do we be accessible? 
how can the church be accessible? And so um, we want you to stand. As you kind of get familiar with this song, would you join in? Would you sing it out with us? Um, I know it's brand new. I don't think we've ever, ever even done it in like a worship night. So again, this is going to be incredibly clunky and the transitions aren't well rehearsed. But what did we just talk about? It's got to be raw and real and accessible. So forgive us as we uh, get queued up for this. Stay. 